Hey guys, welcome back. So today I brought home this storm responder generator. Uh, this one is by far the newest I have ever owned. This is a newer model generator and was listed on Facebook for only $200. According to the listing, it doesn't make power and it has never made power. So, you know, 200 bucks is a bit much for something that doesn't make power. Usually you're gonna lose that investment. So I offered him a hundred bucks and he stopped responding to me. So fine, not a big deal. Anyway, fast forward a day and someone I've done business with before reached out to me and said, hey, do you wanna buy this new generator that doesn't make power? And then he sent me the pictures and it was the exact one I had turned down uh, at $200. Well, he bought it at that price and was looking to get his money back. So. You know, I still wasn't ready to pay that kind of money for this, but we did work out a deal. I traded him an older, less powerful generator for this, plus a bit of cash. So I'm sure he got the better deal here. All I can say is, if it doesn't make power, be prepared to lose whatever you spent on that generator. I mean, sometimes they come back, but do not count on it. Anyway, let me get set up a little bit better. We'll just break out the multimeter and run some tests from the outlets and see if there's any obvious signs of a problem. Okay, hopefully you can see this okay, but I've got my multimeter set to ohms, and before you do any tests, see what the internal resistance is of your meter. Mine is 0.1 ohms, so any readings I get, I can subtract that from it. Now, I don't know what the value should be on this stator, but usually it's between 0.3 and 0.5 ohms. If you don't know, just check both legs and the values should be very similar. So this one with the prong, that's the ground, neutral is across and then leg one and leg two. You just put one of the probes in the neutral and then test a leg. We're at 0.2, which is pretty low. When you subtract the 0 0.1, we're at 0 0.1. So that is almost a dead short in that leg, but it could be okay. Let's check leg two. And we're at 2.2 ohms, which is way too high and not consistent with leg one. So I can pretty much say already without even looking at the stator that we have a bad stator. But let's take the end cover off and just see how bad it is. <laughs> That's a bad sign. That is what just fell out of the end cover. That is a bunch of lacing for the stator. And it's hard to see, but if you look kind of behind the AVR, you can see where everything's been burnt, nice and crispy. So I'm gonna get that AVR out of the way so we can get a better look. Unfortunately, this looks like a total loss. This is far worse than I've ever seen before. The stator, yeah, it melted down. Okay, fine. We'll buy a new one, $375. Won't make much on this one, but I'll make something. Unfortunately, the way this failed, I think it took out the rotor. The wire here that connects to this AVR actually got sucked in 
and got wrapped around the rotor. You can see one of the blue wires right there, kind of wrapped around the slip ring. That most likely broke the wires that connect the rotor to the slip ring. And that means we need a new rotor as well. And that I think costs about $300. So when you factor both of those in, you know, we're looking at $700 to fix this generator and brand new, it was probably an $800 generator. So I don't think that's gonna make sense to do, but let's not jump to any conclusions. Let's get the multimeter on those slip rings and see if we get a reading. And we get nothing, so the rotor's bad. This failure was caused by quality control. The harness that got sucked in should have been held out of the way by a zip tie installed right there. But you can see there is no signs of that. It was never installed. And that's what led to this failure. Unfortunately, this generator is two and a half years old. The warranty on defects is two years. So, you know, I'm not the original owner anyway, so I'm sure that warranty wouldn't apply to me. But I am going to reach out to Briggs. Potentially, they'll honor the warranty, but I am not holding my breath. Anyway, I think the problem here is that although this is a Briggs and Stratton, this is a Chinese clone engine. It is not a Briggs engine. It is not a Briggs powerhead. It is made overseas. And the quality in this case suffered to the point where both the stator and the rotor failed right out of the gate. Now, to buy a new stator and rotor, I think I already mentioned, it's about $700 for this generator. That, that is not an option. This generator is not worth that much, but I might have another option. About a year ago, I repowered a PowerMate that had a bad stator, and I used a Ryobi powerhead and rotor, and I think altogether, that entire powerhead cost about $300. And if that's still available, then that should bolt on to here, but I wanna make sure before ordering it that it's the right shaft on this engine. So I do need to uninstall the stator, get the rotor off, double check what kind of shaft this has, and then place an order. Before I do that, I wanna start the engine. Just make sure there's no surprises. Now, I actually did just get a surprise a second ago. I wish I had the camera rolling, but I checked the oil and was surprised. It was a quart low, and it wasn't even registering on the dipstick. So I added about a quart of some 30 weight mineral oil. And I mean, this engine was advertised as zero hours. I'm sure it has more than zero, given what I'm seeing in the stator, but it can't be much more. Anyway, let's get this started just for a few seconds. Make sure that engine is good.
no surprises here. I mean, that engine started right up and it sounds good. So I'll get this back inside. We'll get the power head off and just double check the type of shaft that this engine has. Just take note of how everything is before you completely disassemble it. You know, in this case, we have a green wire running down from the control panel, which was connected to here, the ground of the generator. And then that is jumpered over to here, which has red wire that jumpers to here. So what I'm guessing is that these two here are the neutral coming out of the generator and it's bonded to ground and they're connected to each other. The gray and the blue coming out of the stator, those are separate legs, and those are the ones producing the 240 volts. So if we get a new stator, these two have to be on separate legs, and the red wire is actually the neutral and needs to be commoned up with the other neutral. Another thing worthy of note, these nuts usually have a lock washer and this one did not have any lock washers. Instead, it looked like they may have used some sort of silicone to kind of hold these nuts in place, which is a bit unusual. Haven't seen that before. I think someone's been in here before. The back of this panel just fell right off. It's supposed to be held in place by these studs here. There's six in total and six nuts that are missing. So most likely not a quality control issue, but yeah, someone has been in here. So we'll have to deal with this at some point. Looks like we have threads in there. It's 
usually an M12, 1.75, so I'll give that a go. It is an M12, 1.75. I think the only drawback is that the threads kind of end a little bit earlier than I'd like. And that could be an issue because the plan is to fill this shaft with water, put some Teflon on here, and then just torque down, build some hydraulic pressure, and pop this off the tapered shaft. Now, the way I see it, there's about maybe six or seven threads before it bottoms out. And I did try running a tap in there and it, it's a hard stop. I really don't think I'm gonna get any more out of this. So I'm gonna try it like this. I'm at a 45 and when I add water, you don't wanna have any air in there because that's gonna make it so this doesn't work. So if a 45 degree angle isn't enough, I'm gonna have to drain the oil out of the engine and stand this completely vertical. All right, plan B, I'm gonna cut down this bolt, the one that was holding this rotor on. I'm gonna cut it short, just a bit, and I'll put a slot on it so I can screw it in, uh, like a, a flathead screw. And I want it to be below this level, that way I can use that M12 bolt to tighten down on top of it and hopefully pop the rotor off. Perfect. There we go. I 
I don't recommend hitting rotor with a hammer. It does cause damage, and of course if you miss, you're gonna hit the windings or the plastic. But in this case, this rotor is done, and I did find the broken wire. It's right there, and I can't quite see where the other end is. You know, I think it goes in underneath, you know, so I can't really access it. And even if I could, I mean, all these wires are coated and kind of glued together with some sort of resin. So it's not easily fixable without pulling the wire. And it's not just this. Anyway, I mean, we need a new stator and they need to be matched. So these two items are trash, but I think I have the information I need. You know, this tapered shaft is the typical Honda clone tapered shaft that I normally see on 5,000 to 8,000 watt generators. And the diameter of the bell housing is also a standard size. So I think we're good there. On the last Ryobi rotor I ordered, the outer diameter of the ball bearing came in at, I think it was 1.85 inches. And that's also a fairly standard size. That's what this one is. And the exhaust system, you know, completely independent. It's not attached to the stator. A lot of Honda clones do attach the exhaust to the end housing on the stator. And that complicates things because the new stator I get is not going to be the same length. It's either going to be shorter or longer than this one. And if it's not matched, if you have an exhaust that attaches to the stator, then you're going to have to modify that a bit. But in my case, don't need to worry about it. Really, the only thing I need to make sure is that the stator lands on this cross member. So I am going to place an order for that Ryobi stator and rotor. Together, it's $210. And it's a 5,500 watt stator. I'm going to take a look at the, the next one up, which is 6,500 watts. And if the price isn't too different, I'll probably get that. So that way it matches the numbers on the generator a bit better. So I'm gonna hit pause here. We'll get some stuff ordered and I'll turn you back on in a bit. And two weeks later, courtesy of FedEx, they're here. You know, I have the new stator and rotor in these boxes. I did end up going with the 6,500 watt model. It was a little bit over $100 more to get the extra thousand watts, but that's fine. I mean, the generator sticker does say it's a 6,000 plus watt generator. So I wanted to match that. And hopefully the stator is a little bit longer than the Ryobi 5,500 watt model. So let's get these out of the box. You know, I want to check them out, make sure they survived shipping. Cause when I picked these up, I could feel them kind of rolling around in there. So I don't think they're packaged very well. Anyway, we'll get them out, clean them up, test them real quick, make sure they're still good. And put it on the generator. Yeah, packaging took a beating. This uh, is where the rotor was, and it was supposed to be secured nicely in there, but instead it was up over here. And the stator, yeah, not much better. You can see this took quite a beating. Anyway, I'm not too surprised. I mean, these weigh quite a bit, and I've had pretty bad luck getting these shipped through the mail. Thankfully, the brushes survived, because I do need a set of those. And it also came with a new uh, terminal block, which is good. This one actually has the lock washers. So I will use this one instead of the one that came with the generator.
I'm going to start with the rotor. That's probably the easiest one to test. I've got the meter set to ohms. Uh, usually on a good rotor, between 40 and 50 ohms is good. Let's see what this one's at. Forty-seven point four ohms. That's good. Check it to ground. No connection. So that rotor appears to be good. For the stator, we've got three wires on this stator. Two are black, and one is white. So they must have commoned up leg one and leg two on the white wire. And we should see about three or four ohms on each of these black wires. We do, we're at 0.4 ohms. Check the other one. 0.4, that is good. 0 0.3, 0 0.4. And then between the black wires, we should see roughly double that. So probably around 0.7 ohms. Yeah, and we're at 0.7. And we'll check it to ground. And we're good, at least on the main legs, leg one, leg two. Uh, let's check these two windings that feed the AVR. We got the blue wires on top. That is the excitation winding and usually comes in at around 1.4, 1 1.5. 1 we're at 1.7, that's fine. And then we have a green and a white. And that usually comes in close to the main legs, so probably around three or four ohms. And we're at point two. I think that's fine. So it would seem like we have a good stator. I guess to be 100% sure, let me check each of these legs to ground. So this is the excitation winding, the sense winding, and I think I already did this one, but we'll just double check. That is good. And then we can just check it to the other coils here. So we'll check the excitation winding to the sense winding. There should be no connection. We'll do excitation to leg one, leg two, and we're good. Let's check the sense winding actually to leg one, leg two. It should come back with a reading because I think it is tied in and that is normal. So it would appear as if we have a good stator and a good rotor. Now, as far as the length goes, this does not look to be six inches. It is five and one eighth of an inch. And that's exactly the same size as the Ryobi 5,500 watt stator. So now I'm wondering if I should have just stuck with that. Like why, why is this the same size? I mean, potentially the wires are thicker. I'm not really sure, but it is gonna cause a bit of a problem mounting this on this generator because it really is expecting a six inch stator and this one is a bit less. So I think I can make it work. So really the only thing to consider here is the rotor bolt and the stator bolts. I did not order those and I have a bunch of extra rotor and stator bolts and I think I have ones that are the right size. So I wanna to try to go with those and if I run into trouble, I might have to pause and order the correct bolts to get this thing together. I need this end housing for the new stator. So there's two long bolts just holding the end housing on. So once those are removed, I should be able to get it off. Oh, wrong one.
I can fix that. The only thing to keep in mind here is that the rotor has a fan that is spinning and keeping everything cool. And the fan, obviously it's a little bit past where the coils end. So if you're using a bolt like this that's a little bit too long, you do not want it to pass here or else it's gonna hit those fins on the fan and just break them off. Guess I should double check the ball bearing. Make sure it's 1.85. And it is. As far as the stator mount issue goes, it is an issue. I mean, I have to move these an inch that way. And this is not gonna let me. At best, I can move it half an inch, but I think the real issue is the design of this mount. The actual stator housing comes down right here and only extends right about there. So if I was able to mount it right under the stator mount point, then we'd be all set. You know, I could just drill a hole about an inch over there and have plenty of clearance on this side. So I'm gonna swap this mount, actually both of them out, for this style mount. A lot of generators use this for their stator mount. It'll be right under the stator, and that will allow me to basically drill a hole right over there and have plenty of clearance. So I'll take some measurements, drill some holes, and then we'll be pretty much ready to go. You know, I double checked my stator and rotor bolts that I have, and I think I have ones that'll work with this power head. So there's really nothing stopping me once I get these moved.
Before proceeding with the electrical side of things, it's a good time to pull the engine over. You know, the spark plugs are moved. I should have mentioned that earlier, but before doing any work on the power head, I always remove the spark plug and drain the carburetor. I don't want there to be any possibility of this engine firing, but with the spark plug removed, there's no compression. So I'm just gonna pull it over. I wanna make sure it rotates easily and that I don't hear that rotor making contact with the stator. And we're good. I found the correct size nuts for these studs so I can reattach the cover, but before I do, I wanna have a look in here. I mean, clearly someone's been in here, potentially they've moved stuff around, and I don't wanna assume it's correct because I just spent a decent amount of money on a new generator head, and I don't want it to immediately melt down. So the way you check this is to just follow the wires that come up from the stator. In this case, we have four wires. We'll start with the green, which is the ground. That should connect to all the outlets, you know, starting at the 240, the 120, and the 120. And if you follow that wire, you can see it is connected and jumpered over and connected in the right spot. So the ground wire seems to be fine. Uh, next, we have the neutral, which for some reason they used red. Not my first choice, but it's the same idea as the ground. It should be connected to all the outlets on the neutral terminal and jumpered to each outlet. And it is. So we look good there. Another double check is to just compare on the 240 outlet the position of these wires. They should be diagonal from each other, and they are. So most likely that is all good. Uh, the other wires we have here are a gray and a blue. This is leg one and leg two, and they come through the fuse and come out and go over to the 240 outlet, and they are diagonal from each other. So it would seem like that wiring is fine. And then leg one and leg two feed each 120 outlet individually. So this gray wire is only gonna feed one of the outlets. And if you follow it, it comes through a fuse and goes to this outlet here, so we're good. And then the blue, again, goes through a fuse and connects only to this outlet. So the high voltage wiring from the stator to the outlets looks good. Uh, the other thing to consider here are these boards over here. There's two of them, and they may have been damaged when that stator melted down. So we won't know till we power this thing up, but if they are damaged, we can bypass them or get new ones. Uh, the board here on the left detects carbon monoxide, and the black wire here is tied into the, the switch and feeds a ground basically down to the ignition coil. So if your carbon monoxide detector is malfunctioning and you have to get your generator running, then you can unplug this connector and your generator should start. And this module here has an LCD display and these amp clamps over lake one and lake two. And this will measure amps, wattage, voltage, hertz, engine hours, and maybe a few other things. But you know, this here, everything looks in order. So I don't think we have an issue there. But as one final check, you know, I wanna check the actual wires here. None of them should be cross-connected. You know, I have a feeling, because these boards are in circuit, that we are gonna read something. So if we do, we'll isolate it, take those boards out of circuit, and just double check it again. All right, we'll start with the ground wire. We're just checking in ohms to the neutral. No connection. Leg one, we're good. Leg two, we're good. Let's check neutral to leg one. We do have a connection, about 243,000 ohms. And to leg two, we have a connection. 730,000 ohms. So let's unplug these boards and we'll try it again.
neutral to leg one, we're good. To leg two, we're good. And let's just check between leg one and leg two. We're good. So this should be safe. So I'm just gonna bolt this cover back on. I'll replug those boards in first and we'll get this installed. So I'm starting here with the neutral wire, which is the white wire in this case coming out of the stator to the red wire going up to the control panel. And this one is neutral bonded, this generator. So we also need a green wire connecting the neutral to ground. I think it goes without saying, it's, it's very important you understand how this wiring is, and there's a lot of different variations. You know, some generators have three wires coming out like this, some have four, and you need to know where are the neutrals, where are the huts, and how they combine. Also, going up to the control panel, there's sometimes three wires and sometimes four. Sometimes you have a jumper between neutrals, sometimes you don't need it because it's jumpered up above. And even with this neutral bond, sometimes that's done elsewhere or not at all, depending upon your application. So don't take this stuff lightly. You know, if you're not sure, don't do it. Hire someone. This is the AVR that came with this generator, and this is the cord that got sucked in. There is no damage physically to this, and I don't think I have any other AVRs, so I'm gonna give this one a try, but potentially, if it doesn't power up, this could be the issue.
What do you think? Is it going to power up? And if it does, are the electronics going to work? Or is it just going to let out some smoke? Uh, let's find out. I get the fuel connected and turned on. So we'll get this thing fired up and see what happens. couple things. The engine it's running a bit slow and I noticed this spring was not connected which seemed to be running fine without it connected but it does help the engine so that it does not surge. So that's all set. I'm going to start it back up. We'll adjust the engine speed, bring it up to 61 and a half and then try load testing it. Adding that spring back to the governor rod did speed the engine up. It was actually closer to 63 hertz, so I backed that off just a touch to get it closer to 62. Now the voltage, it is low, and that's mostly because that AVR was tuned for a different power head. So I need to pull it off, adjust that potentiometer, and just get the voltage closer to 120 volts. Let's try that. All right, we're getting there. It looks like if I turn it a half turn clockwise, it goes up about a volt, and I'm now at 110 volts. So I guess I'll start with three full turns and see where I'm at. Getting close, I'll take three more turns.
Not too bad. The engine, the power head, they're doing exactly what they should. Now, this was advertised as an engine with zero hours. And as we saw on that display, it does have 20 hours on it. Granted, that is not much. And when you consider someone spent $900 on this generator, closer to a thousand once you factor in taxes and only got 20 hours out of it due to the missing zip tie. Anyway, that zip tie is there now. Hopefully this Ryobi powerhead will last quite a bit longer than the original. So I hope this video helps someone. Thanks for watching.